Greetings, it is I, Tantus Nair van Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It's time to continue our expose on the history of Magic the Gathering. This week we're talking about Visions. So let's dive right into talking about Visions. So Visions was released in February 3rd of 1997. It was a 167 card set. It continued the themes of cumulative upkeep, flanking, phasing, and some of the other various types of themes that existed within Mirage. It was the 10th expansion to be released and the second set in the Mirage block and the first actual small set within the Mirage block. It was the first set to have what are considered very high quality cards on the common level, such as River Boa. It was a creature that had two different abilities and it was a common card. This made the ability to use a lot more commons in decks more feasible as they were then more reasonable to use. That they weren't just throwaway cards, they were actually more decent common cards being released. This was the first set to do that. This set also increased the speed of red decks in general. It made them faster decks to use. For example, if you had a burn deck, with the addition of this deck, you could very easily have enough spells that you could throw out and do 20 damage for a direct burn deck in. This set also introduced something new. For non-basic lands, if they produced only a single color, it gave them appropriate colored text boxes. So if it was a land that would only produce green, it would have a green text box. Now, for other non-basic lands that were producing multiple colors of mana, they didn't introduce anything similar to this until they got into evasion. So for now, though, the non-basic lands just had their own sort of thing going for them. The lands were not standardized until 5th edition, which a lot of the land colorations standardized until... Now this set had 15 cards to a pack, and the booster box had 36 packs. The art on all the packs was of Tefri's Puzzle Box. This was actually the first set to have a wide dispersal of pre-release events. So up until now, we we're only beginning to get into pre-release events. As with Mirage, they began to have multiple cities. Now it was almost more of a wider release of it. It's expanding the releases of the pre-release events. So the story of Visions continuing where Mirage left off, where the three nations of Jamora are battling against the evil Karabek. Unfortunately, the nation of Femerf has fallen, and the other two nations are facing internal struggles. At this point in time, when things are seeming darkest, the, an ally of Karabek's, Jarel, is convinced to betray him by the planeswalker Tefri. With Jarel's help, the three nations band together and manage to rescue Magnara from the Amber Prison and begin the fight back against Karabek. Now, this set still had poison counters. This would actually be the last set that would have Use of poison counters for 10 years. So this was the last time you saw it. it did continue with some enchant worlds. It had the cantrips where if you and when you played them, the next upkeep would draw a card. And of course it continued with the enchant creatures that once you played them, they would be there. You could play them as an instant and then they would go away. They also introduced a lot of abilities of when creatures came into play. So this was a deck that had a good amount of that ability. It expanded and pushed forward that that was something that was an ability that a lot of creatures would have, even more now and day. The coming into play abilities. Originally, Visions was going to be part of the Mirage set, but when Mirage was getting too big during development, it was split off. And, and the first name that they had for it was Mirage Jr. until they settled on Visions. Now, Visions is the same name as a card that was previously printed and they almost changed the name because of this and it took them a while to decide whether or not they were going to finalize name Visions. Now Mark Rosewater, who is currently the head designer of Magic Cards at Wizards of the Coast, he was actually very instrumental in balancing the power level of Visions. So he was involved at this point in time and he's been with Wizards for quite a while before he was promoted to the position he is now, which we can all thank him for the great work he does on Magic. So the set had some cycles just as Mirage. It had a charm cycle just like Mirage. It actually had a, a cycle of enchantments that would hose the, one of the enemy colors or damage one of the enemy colors. It had a cycle of multicolored rares of opposing colors. It had a cycle of chimeras, which were artifact creatures that you could sacrifice to hit a 2-2 counter on another chimera and also give it the special ability. So if it's a flying chimera and I, I sacrifice it, I get a plus 2, plus 2 counter and flying to another chimera so you can stack them. And finally, it had a cycle of what are referred to as Karu lands. These were lands that when you came into play, you buried them unless you sacrificed an appropriate land of the color it produced. But when you tap that land, it produced a colorless and a color of the choice. So if it was a, if it was a white man that produced a white and a colorless, I had to sacrifice a plains when it came into play. That actually was Karu, and it's named after that. Now, Visions was the last non-starter set to not include any legendary permanents. It did not have any. So now let's start talking about some of the cards from Visions. 
There's, of course, Chronotog. Chronotog is a creature that you can spend zero mana and give it plus three, plus three until end of turn, but you skip your next turn. So you effectively could feed it a turn of your own in order to give it a boost of, of power and toughness. It was on a similar vein to the Atog that was previously printed in Antiquities, and it in fact itself was another Atog, and it's not the last Atog that was printed. Now there was Goblin Recruiter. When it came into play, you could search your library for any number of goblins, reveal them, shuffle your library, and then put the revealed goblins on top of your library in any order. It's actually one that's still got some value, and it's very good for if you're using a goblin deck. There's Necrotal. It is one of the ones that happens to enter the battlefield ability. When it enters the battlefield, you destroy target non-black, non-artifact creature. It cannot be regenerated. Similarly, there was Mana War. When it enters the battlefield, you return to target creature to its owner's hand. There was Relentless Assault. You played it after you would have a combat phase. You would untap all the creatures that had participated in combat this turn, and then you get an additional combat phase and main phase after the one you're in. So I have my normal main phase, I attack. After that attack, I would play Relentless Assault in my second main phase, get a second attack phase, and get a, sec a third main phase. And during the second attack phase, I could have untapped all the ones I already attacked with. Of course, any kind of damage and stuff would still remain on them, but I get to attack again. And then there is Squandered Resources. Squandered Resources, I could sacrifice a land in order to gain a mana of any color that that land could produce. So if I sacrifice a forest, I can get a green. If I sacrifice a non-basic land that could produce multiple different types of colors, I would get one of those of my choice. There's Uktabi Orangutan. When it entered the battlefield, I destroyed target artifact. There's Undiscovered Paradise. I could tap it for any color mana, but during my next untap phase, I had to return it to my hand. There's Vampiric Toter. I could search my library for any card, and I would shuffle my library, place it on top of my library, and pay two life. There's Natural Order. An additional cost to playing Natural Order, I sacrificed a green creature, but then I could search my library for a green creature and put it into the battlefield. There's Fire Blast. Fire Blast does four damage to target creature or player. But, instead of paying its mana cost, I can sacrifice two mountains. This is one of the reasons that red got ramped up, that I could sacrifice two mountains to all of a sudden do four damage, after I was already burning someone for a bunch. Hence why this is one of the ones that sped up red burn decks very quickly. There's Helm of Awakening. Spells cost one less to play. Everybody's spells just a little cheaper. And of course, the last one I want to talk about is Tefri's Puzzle Box. It's pictured on the booster pack, so I would want to mention it. So what Teferi's Puzzle Box does is the beginning of each player's draw step, so when, right before they draw an actual card, they count the number of cards they have in their hand, put them in any order, and put them on the bottom of their library. Then they draw the number of cards they just had in their hand, and that's their new hand. Of course, then they can draw their card as normal, because it's the beginning of your draw phase, but you're effectively shifting through your cards constantly and very quickly. So if you have a big hand, you can just cycle through your deck over and over again and go through very quickly. So that's it for today. I went over the history of visions. I told you a little bit about how it came about, some of the things that are interesting little facts about it, and what kind of stuff is in the deck. I also talked about a few of the cards that are in the deck. If you have any questions, comments, anything to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, subscribe. It shows your support for the channel, the empire, and the work I do. And until the next time, I bid you farewell.